professionals in their different fields. And today I have Dr. Natasha J. Thomas. Can you just tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do, how you got started? Okay. Hi, Faye. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, I am from Daytona Beach, Florida, and I um, am a psychiatrist that takes care of adults right now, primarily um, focusing on women's mental health issues mm -hmm. and especially people who are dealing with reproductive issues. Mm -hmm and who need care for depression or anxiety or other concerns. Mm -hmm. um, the way I got started was primarily just doing kind of like a linear pathway through my education. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to do, become a doctor. Um, there was a time where I thought I wanted to be a writer, oh, wow. try to combine both mm -hmm. uh, with my parents' encouragement. <laughs> and um, I went to college at Spelman and then I went to um, University of Miami for medical school mm -hmm. um, and before actually before I went to medical school I went to a um, summer program for minorities mm -hmm. in Chicago and that really helped me solidify like, my feelings about wanting to be a doctor yeah. um, and so then from that point on I continued in my uh, studies at Spelman I was a biology major mm -hmm. and we had a really supportive pre-health pre-medicine mm -hmm. department and they helped to get us on the right path, and so yeah. And Spelman, and also like some dates, like when you applied, when you got in, mm -hmm. what your undergrad experience was, and then the process to get into med school. Okay, so I um, applied. You mean for college? For college. For so college. Yeah. Okay, so I started to Spelman in 1997. Okay. Um, <laughs> I really can't believe it's been that much time, like really and truly. So um, initially. I want. I have been exposed to Spelman ever since I was very young mm -hmm. through service organizations and um, sororities back home in Daytona Beach, mm -hmm. um, and so they would bring the kids up here for a Black College tour, HBCU tour, and I would go ever since I was little, like six, mm -hmm. and it was predetermined that I would be going to Spelman. And then my last year of high school, I was like, you know what? I think I might give Hampton a try. <laughs> I was like, Hampton, where did that come from? Hampton was a great school. We went and visited and everything, mm -hmm. and. And in the end, I ended up applying for both um, and received my acceptance letters. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, okay, it's going to be Spelman. I know for sure it's going to mm -hmm. be Spelman. Has college always been something that was in your life goal and your plans? And how did you know you wanted to become, like, go to med school? My family is very focused on education. Mm -hmm. My mother is an educator. And so are several other people in my family. Um, and. I never really thought about not going to college. Mm -hmm. To me, it was always like the next step after exactly. high school and everything. Um, I wanted to become, initially, at Spelman actually, I was a biology major and a writing minor. Oh, wow. Because I, because I love both. Mm -hmm. I love cool science, yeah. and, I loved, <laughs> and I loved English and writing. Um, and that really, I can attribute that to really excellent teachers that I had in my formative years mm -hmm. that were really strong in both areas. I went to a, pro a program for minorities in Chicago mm -hmm. And they had them around the country. Um, and you were there for six weeks. You did MCAT preparation, you did lectures, mm -hmm. you got to do a little bit of learning about clinical work. Mm -hmm. It was great, it was an awesome, awesome experience. And while I was there, um, I saw, actually I saw a quote up on, uh, inside the atrium of one of the schools. Mm -hmm. We were at uh, Northwestern University and um, it just kind of like confirmed to me that that was my path and that was like the calling for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna definitely be into it but not put my writing down. So I did creative writing and all of that all the way through wow. school. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was easy to get prepared for applying for med school and all of that just because of how supportive Spelman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just because of how, how supportive our department was. So we had great professors. Uh, my class had, an, unprecedented amount of people get accepted into medical school. We were very That's prepared. Yeah. We took uh, MCAT preparation classes together. Mm -hmm. 
everybody's studying together, everybody's supporting each other, and then um, they li they lined for us what the application should be, application process should be to get into medical school, and everybody just kind of supported each other. My goal was to get back to Florida, yeah. so I applied to schools in Florida. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was it, yeah. which was maybe a little bit of a gamble. <laughs> or excuse a little bit of risky. Because I think at the time we only had three medical schools wow. yeah. in Florida. So, um, or that I knew of, right? Mm -hmm. So it was University of South Florida, University of Miami, and University of Florida. Family, children, just life outside of your career. Okay. So I think um, I would describe myself as kind of free-spirited, laid-back, homebody. I would describe myself as mm, creative mm -hmm. and really enjoying music and writing. Mm -hmm. um, my family is everything to me. Uh, I'm married mm -hmm. and I have a daughter that's almost 10. Wow. And I'm very blessed that my parents have moved from Florida to Atla the Atlanta area to help mm -hmm. me raise her mm -hmm. and take really good care of her. So mm -hmm. they get to they pick her up after school. Mm -hmm. and. They, my mom feeds her and everything <laughs> like that. And they're extremely supportive with stuff that she has, projects for school and all that. Yeah. Um, and so in my free time, really if I, if I could, mm -hmm. I could find myself kind of like hold up just reading all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but my family is, it's interesting, my family, my, mom, my daughter told me, she's like, you know, mom, you are an in-body and I'm an out-body. <laughs> she's trying to say home-body, <laughs> right? Um, so they keep me active with doing mm -hmm. things for her activities. My husband rides a motorcycle. Oh. I sometimes ride with him, which I would never have imagined. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do. And he, um, well, my, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother was in a bike club. Wow. So sometimes when I was scared to ride, I was like, this is just so irresponsible, Tasha. Like, really? <laughs> like, why am I doing this? Oh, no. <laughs> but um, when I did, I was like, you know, I was taking on my grandmother and her love for biking. Yeah. And it, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being from Daytona, my, my goal is to get to Daytona Bike Week. So we ride yeah. down on our bike or that's something amazing. like that. that that's a goal. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me a little bit about how you balance um, or how you balance your social life, this is undergrad and med school, how you balance your social life as well as, you know, school and mm -hmm. life with school, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when I was really young, and even in med school, uh, the best thing about my experience or my academics was the women that I was around. So my girlfriends were all really going for the same things in mm -hmm. life, and it made it a lot easier for me to feel like we did everything together. We study together, we take tests together, yeah. then we celebrate together. So <laughs> what was the first job or internship you did that was related to your field? First job or internship? Mm -hmm. You know, even before I got into psychiatry, even before I settled on psychiatry, because that was not my first pick in med yeah. school. Mm -hmm. um, but even before that, when I was growing up, I went to a Catholic school, and mm -hmm. as part of the graduation requirements for eighth graders, you had to do a certain amount of community service hours. Mm -hmm. And I worked in an Alzheimer's care, mm -hmm. like respite care, daycare type facility, which I absolutely loved. That was my first introduction really to neurology. Yeah. Um, and then everything else was school, 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 right? <laughs> I might have done a little bit of work study at, at Spelman. I worked at the desk when people would come visit and say, give me your ID. <laughs> If you're not out by 11 whatever, you won't get this ID. <laughs> um, but other than that, I was just mainly studying or doing research. Like we had as part of um, the honors program that I was in at Spelman, you had to do research as part of graduation. So I did that in Morehouse School of Medicine for probably two years. And um, then after that, really the first time I really worked in my field was after residency. Wow. So I moved here in 2010 after I graduated and started private practice here, worked here at Ro in Roswell mm -hmm. for six years, and then I've been in my current location for a year and a half. Yeah. Can you tell me how it was being a woman of color, um, going through that with your studies and then entering into your career as well? Mm -hmm. I think that you find yourself having certain challenges that other people may not appreciate. You know, um, Sometimes you might feel as if others think you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had experiences where people were not sure that I was a doctor, and that is because I'm female yeah. and because I'm a black woman, exactly. you know. Um, sometimes 
<clears throat> I've had people actually come up and read my degree to make sure that wow. it's just double check. Real. Is she really? <laughs> Are you sure? Wow. You know, I've had times where I was not allowed into events at schools because people didn't believe I didn't have my ID. Yeah. So my classmates didn't have their IDs either, but mm -hmm. nobody but they questioned if they believe mm -hmm. belong there. Yeah. So things like that, but it's okay because mm -hmm. it it builds in you um, if you don't let it break you down a lot of strength and you get resolve about what your purpose is exactly. so it doesn't deter you mm -hmm. it just makes you better yeah, it makes you stronger as well. about your job now what your like day-to-day -day involves your roles all that stuff okay so i get in every day around nine o'clock mm -hmm. start seeing patients um mondays through thursdays i'm here nine to five technically nine to five mm -hmm. but it ends up running over it does yeah. and then fridays i try to do half days to save time for personal stuff and my daughter's school stuff and appointments and when I get here, I do a lot of medication checks, which is essentially 15 to 20 minute appointments where you review with patients how they're doing and if they're making progress on their medications. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also enjoy doing psychotherapy with people, which are longer sessions and we talk about more, you know, deep issues yeah. and patterns and that kind of thing. Um, really, even for the short sessions that I do, I do therapy and everything that I do. Yeah. And I try to make it so that my patients feel this is a completely safe space yeah. and we have fun here. Mm -hmm. And if you cry, that's okay. Yeah. You know, so that it feels like home. So I end up seeing, it could, you know, it could vary maybe 12 patients a day, maybe as many as 16, which yeah. can sometimes be, you know, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but my field is very, very, very underserved. Yeah. So if we have to do extra work, that's what it is. People are in need. And so, um, generally, I do my sessions, and in between, there's a lot of like checking emails, making phone calls, calling the prescriptions and paperwork. Um, but every and everything I do, I'm trying to put the patient first and offering them the best care. So I spend a lot of time doing emails. A lot of doctors don't do emails, but it's it's, it's part like, of it. Yeah. It's part of what you have to do. How are you going to talk to people all day? People need help, and psychiatry is not something where you can kind of say, "Okay, we'll get to that later." Exactly. So. If it happens in the moment, you have to tackle it right on. Yeah. yeah. So, what advice would you give to your younger self? Mm -hmm. That's a great one. Um, I would tell my younger self to calm down. Okay. In mm -hmm. my twenties, I felt like for some reason I was old and I was running out of time. That I wasn't going to be able to. Um, do all of this medicine stuff and also have the family life that I wanted, that I was I was running out of time to get married, that I was running out of time to have children. I really don't know where that came from. My parents never said that to me. Yeah. And I feel like some of my girlfriends, not all, but some of my girlfriends seem to have that same kind of like anxiety about it. So I would say calm down, mm -hmm. enjoy the moment, don't panic when things aren't going your way. I'm talking about in personal life. Yeah. Like just take it in stride. Mm -hmm. um, I probably would have would have let myself have a little bit more fun, you know, mm -hmm. and I would have, you know, I would have told my, my younger self that um, it's okay, like the things about you that you, in your 20s, and I hear this when I talk to my patients, mm -hmm. people feel so insecure about like their path, am I doing okay? Yes. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. And how do I compare it to other people? Exactly. It takes a. It took me a little while, and I feel like I see this in patients that I work with too. A little while to like settle into your skin, and then the twenties just does not seem to be the time mm -hmm. where people. No, and I would say you're totally fine, exactly how you are. So just go through your journey step by step by step. I feel like you're talking to me right Aww. now. <laughs> I can take all this advice because I'm about to turn twenty three mm -hmm. next month. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff, I just graduated, so a lot of stuff is just happening really fast. A lot of change, so mm -hmm. yeah, I'm definitely going to take the take advice for this. What's the most difficult thing you've faced in your career? Do you mean as far as like the field or... It can be balancing being a mom and your career. It can be within the field itself. It can just be anything remotely related to your career. Okay. I think there's two things. Mm -hmm. So one thing is the direction of medicine currently. Yeah. And then the other thing was a transition that I had to make in my career. So like I said before, everything for me has been very linear. Mm -hmm. You know, I went from one school to the next school to the next school to work. Mm -hmm. And when things don't go that way, I'm like, wait, that's not, I don't know what to do now because mm -hmm. that's, that's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. And so there was a point where I had to transition to a different practice. Mm -hmm. And that was a bit challenging for me to actually like leave the practice um, because it was a risk. 
it was not the plan. Yeah. You know, my father worked at the same power company from the time I was like eight months old until I was 35. Wow. So we have that like staying yeah. quality Loyalty and I was to, like, yeah. you know, we can make this work out. But in truth, I had to um, honor myself and my gift as a psychiatrist exactly. and I needed the environment to reflect to my patients the same thing that I was trying to give them and I didn't feel like I could do that yeah. and so really and truly an honor to my purpose in life I had to make a change and completely step out on faith I had no other job yeah. I just emailed people and said hey you need a psychiatrist <laughs> and people did yeah. and people did so um, that's that was one thing that was really challenging at the time mm -hmm. and the other thing with medicine that I talked about is how you can provide good care when you're having to jump through lots of different hoops. You want a certain medication for someone, insurance doesn't want to cover it, or you've got to do this step and this step and this step, which you're like, how am I supposed to do that during the day and see yeah. my patients? You know, or, you know, people can't afford services or underinsured or not insured at all, mm -hmm. and you still want to help, right? Exactly. So, like, how do you balance out some of the things about medicine that have kind of detracted from the, pra the actual practice yeah, of medicine purpose, and yeah. connecting with your patients. So I think that takes uh, daily intention, you know, the focus, because you could just get in here. I could get in here and just get that script pad and be like, go through the motion. Next, yeah. next, next, next. Mm -hmm. But that's not at all, you know, like what I want to leave people with. Exactly. It's a big deal for someone to go to a doctor at all, to invest in your health at all. But especially because of the stigma of mental health, mm -hmm to actually make the phone call to say, I need some help with, yeah. with a situation and come here and sit in that waiting room and exactly. wait. So when I come out there, I want people to feel loved, really, and feel like they're safe. Mm -hmm. And so I can't be about prescription pad psychiatry yeah. exactly. if, if that's what I'm trying to convey. So what that, what that will end up translating to is that sometimes you have to make hard decisions, sometimes you have to work longer hours than you may have intended. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the only way to really you know, keep the healing yeah, in medicine. And help people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that brings up an interesting point. What do you think about society's views on mental health and the stigma behind it? Is it changing? Is it staying the same? Like, what do you think about that? I think, you know, we now we have the benefit of social media, so you can kind of see what people are thinking based on things that they post. Mm -hmm. um, so I see some improvements. I don't think it's as taboo to talk about yeah. concerns and things like that. I still see that we have bias in our language, mm -hmm. so that doesn't help, you know. So we, if we um, are joking around and calling people bipolar, but it's meant to be like you're erratic, mm -hmm. or it's meant to be like you're moody, like it means it's a colloquialism. Exactly. That doesn't help the person who actually does have bipolar disorder. So I think that we are moving in the direction of improved awareness and less stigma, but we still have work to do. You know, in the African American community, we still have a, a lot, lot of work, work to, to do. do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, because black women are receiving the, the least psychiatric care in the country, or we're at the, the bottom. Yeah. With, you know, we're one of the groups at the bottom. Even if we do reach out, we a lot of times don't end up getting the standard of care that we need. That we need. So, um, so we continue to work. Mm -hmm. we're, we're moving, but we're continuing to work. Do you have any other like final words you want to share? Or anything you want to just let people know about that you're working on? Talk about your blog. Oh, well? okay. Yeah. So at the end of March, I 2018, I launched a website and. It um, is called Hope Grove Psychiatry. Hope mm -hmm. Grove is my business that I contract my, my psychiatric services under, mm -hmm. and it's also the name of my website and blog. And the reason why I wrote the, the blog really was because um, I wanted to add to like, the richness of the experience that my patients can get, mm -hmm. so that if they leave the session and I say, you know, I think maybe you have post-traumatic stress, and I try to tell them what it's about, a lot of times people don't remember what you talk about mm -hmm. in session, exactly. a large percentage of it. Mm -hmm. So if I can hand them something and say, go and read this, this is what I'm talking about, and I know it's coming from me, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry that they're going to get on the internet and get information yeah. that's, or just get misinformation, exactly. right? So that was one reason I wrote it. The other reason is because um, I was thinking of those people that are contemplating getting help but need to like start thinking about it in the privacy of their own home. Yeah. And I thought, you know, if it's 
information that people can read that's easy to read and down to earth and it seems like, you know, I created the website to be like, this is our space. Mm -hmm. So you can read about whatever here, you can ask whatever questions. That's why I started it. So I do weekly vlogs and I've got a few um, main articles and then I've got weekly vlogs that come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, my hope is to soon be doing like support groups for some of the groups that I hear people talk about the same things mm -hmm. in here and I'm like, you need a group. So yeah. I want to do a group for um, moms coming out, people who are going through their first pregnancy, yeah. things like that. Those are my some of my hopes mm -hmm. for this year, yeah. for 2018. Yeah. I love that. You guys should definitely check that out. I've read pretty much a lot of your posts yeah. already. And she's an amazing writer and she has a beautiful way of conveying different topics that are kind of hard to dive into with the medical perspective, but she makes it more relatable in a sense. You okay, know. thank you. Good feedback. Thank you, baby. <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. Um, make sure to check out all of Dr. Thomas's um, links and her um, page, her blog. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>